Hi guys, I'm Danny, and I started the Sunday Gym because I've noticed lately that people tend to go to colleges and universities without actually knowing why they're there. Afterwards, starting jobs are unfulfilling, so I'm interviewing different professionals to see what they have to say and to share their experience and knowledge with you. I hope you enjoy it. Right on, Bobs, thank you for being here. How are you doing? Doing well. It's a pleasure to join you and have this conversation with you today. It's a pleasure to have you here because you have a tremendous experience and I'm sure you're going to be a remarkable example. The podcast is going to be focused on three main questions. What do you do for a living? How did you get there? And how did you know that this was the way to go? So tell us what you do for a living, please. So what do I do for a living? It's a very good question. So struggle with this question many times because if I just use the title, people just assume different things. So I tend to use the tagline, my role is to get things done. Nice. So if you're a leader, if you work within a team, my job is to make sure that you get things done and that's it. From a professional career or title perspective, I tend to use the term change practitioner. So it's more of a catch-all phrase for program manager, program director, project manager, project lead. There's so many terms in that space. But at the end of the day, the focus is get things done. And that's my that's my role. Now, the, the best way to tease that out a little bit so you understand, probably with an example. So when I first started in the role, I was brought into an organization and they had an the organization, that business area, they were, they said there was a lead, lead table, table. And for that area, the organization, pretty large organization, multinational organization across many countries, they were mid table. So if you assume you've got 20 organizations in that space, they will rank about 10, 11. And they had this idea that if they were into, able to integrate another platform into their system, it will move them from position 10, 11 to about four or five. This was the idea. But to do that, they needed to integrate with this new open source system that customers could use. So I was brought in to make that happen. So in reality, what did that mean? It meant working with the development team in the organization. It meant working with the vendor. So you tend to just say the vendor, a, a solution provider, think of that as an, that's another business entirely with their own departments, you've got to work with them. It meant working with the operations team. So when you implement it, you need people to change the way they work, change their practices. It meant working with the sales team. So once again, you're trying to move up the league table. So the sales team needs to take this thing you're doing and sell it. It meant working with the leadership team. They're going to put in, I put a number close, about $3 million um, dollars on this and they expect to make double that in a couple of years. How are you tracking that money? How are you providing them the confidence that they're in spending the this money the corporate world normally, right if it's not double, it's a zero. This is <laughs> yeah. This is the basic uh, the yeah. basic calculation. Uh, I found out that the, that I found about that the hard way because yeah, if 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 you, if you don't double it, consider it a zero. Uh, I'm but pretty so, sure so, your I, situation was rather similar. I, I agree, and what I tend to do is a good point. I tend to try and provide leaders a way of coming up to with a realistic expectation, because it's very easy to sell this hockey stick growth pattern. That, oh, you're going to invest this small amount and you're going to just multiply. And sometimes you get lucky. When the real sometimes world, that doesn't you happen. Do and you put it very nicely. Yes, sometimes you get lucky, but lucky has nothing to do with skills. And uh, exactly. it, 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 it's a pretty good thing that you mentioned it because yeah, obviously you're a talented guy. Obviously, you know a lot about a, a lot of things. I, I don't think you would have been able to be so successful if you actually weren't a people's person. Because as you said, it you, you had to run circles. You had to went to the development team. You have to uh, went to the research, to the uh, sales, to this and that. Now, I don't think you would have been able to do it if you really weren't like naturally a hum uh, not, people's person. Yeah. Because you it, really a... established that vibe. You really need to, to do this. I, I totally agree. Um, and maybe when we get to the second question, I'll probably talk talking a bit yeah. more. Um, what I, in terms of what I do, what I notice as to your point is there are actually two key areas when it comes to getting things done. So there's the obvious area which a lot of people take um focus on is what's your plan, what's your structure, how are you communicating, how are you facilitating. Those are obvious. But the other points to what you're saying there is more the the leadership element. How are you connecting with people, right? 
somebody's given a job and yes, they're a developer, but if they're upset, they're going to write code for eight hours, but the quality is different, yep. right? Their, yep. their energy is different. How are you connecting with people? How are you influencing people? There was there was somebody on the team for this initiative I was running. He had about 15 years more experience than me, 15 years more experience than I was, but his attitude was just creating a lot of friction in the team. I had to change that. I had to just get some guidance. How do I deal with this person to change his behavior so the team could work together? Because it's not just you as in the, on leading the team, but you have to get everybody to do their part because you can't be in everything. So it's about influencing, connecting, motivating. So that's what I do. I focus on getting things done. And I think one of the reasons why we connected, what I noticed over time is a lot of people focus on the, the hard skills, the very factual, technical elements of change leadership, of getting things done. And even when things work out well, so I, a lot of times I'll finish a program of work and I get lots of feedback, but the feedback always is around, oh, this is a very good plan. The communication was really good. Like, well, it was a good plan, but we had to cohese together. We had to build trust, right? That's why it was a good plan. So I've started doing lots of writing, lots of speaking, just to get this point across that, to your point. You, I you have personally person. noticed that people actually tend to do, tend to be way more open in, in the private sector. As, as you mentioned, that former colleague of yours with the nasty temper, in the government sector, like 90%, like that you can you can walk into any government building and you can you can cut the tension with a knife. You, you have to carry a samurai sword with you to, <laughs> to go to the person that you have a meeting with. It's crazy, but it, that's not, not the case for the private sector. So definitely we're both of us are lucky to be here. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of that, the second question, how did you get there? So uh what what, what happened? Uh how do you end up on this position? Yeah, so answering that, I'm gonna to have to condense it quite a bit because yeah. the journey yeah. is ne never, never linear. So I'll start with one of my earliest roles. So I was a software developer. So I actually started as a software developer as an engineer in in Lagos in Nigeria, and I was providing software solutions to banks, community banks, um, and. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. And we had this client. All our clients were of a certain class, a certain level. Then there was this client that was you know, slightly more advanced, slightly more sophisticated. And we we're providing a software solution to the bank. So our clients were actually the technology company, technology departments within the banking firm. So I got there. I wrote, hold on. The people we were providing this service to, I got speaking to, with them. I realized they earned a lot more money than I did. They worked fewer hours, you know, a lot more comfortable. I said, hold on, we're doing the same thing. We have the same skill sets and I'm really pushing it. And they're like, no, take it easy, nice and calm, have time to think. So I said, how can I do this? How do I, and you know, do the same, oh, well, do less work and more money. So I found my way and I looked for opportunities to move out from what I was doing into financial services. So I ended up, so I was working in an investment bank in London. So that was the first step, just looking for opportunities yeah observer was around me and then taking steps towards that um what i did because that's just still as a developer what i noticed another trend while i was um, working still as a developer in london was a lot of technology roles were being moved outside london um you you probably based on where you you, you be aware of this so you, uh, lots of countries so you'd be thinking of singapore india uh, a lot, lots of lots of countries, lots of roles are being moved out of London. Well, it's basically and... like a global outsourcing movement. So yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So so I said, okay, if that's the pattern, who's being retained here? If I want to stay here, and I noticed it was the people who could connect all the dots. Yep, it was, and that's when I deliberately started positioning myself, shipping what I did, looking for opportunities. I couldn't agree more with change. you. And honestly, you, you made my day by saying this because one of the things I love about Europe is because it's between the US and Asia. So the whole outsourcing thing, we can basically connect with all of them because yeah. of the time zones. So it's very easy for us here in Europe to, to maintain the issue the issues that are occurring in Asia, mostly China, Singapore, and India, and the issues that occur in, uh, in the United States. So uh, and and 
when you, you said it perfectly when you said that you had to connect the dots meaning that you have to be aware of what's going of what's happening around you uh if you notice that some people really aren't paying attention they're like they're, they're not navigating the ship they're, they're just down the river and whatever happens which is and those are all people with great potential this is why i actually made this podcast this is why i'm inviting so many guests here so that they, they can see they can see that this is happening so yeah you definitely uh, nailed it that that was perfectly said yeah i, I think uh, like you said it's it's about noticing change um because a lot of people don't they don't notice change if you're not paying attention to what's around you you need to notice change and then ask yourself critical questions based on the change you're seeing right now are you rightly positioned for this do you have the skill sets that will be relevant in the next five years? And you need to be honest with yourself. And if you if you're not, then take action. Because I know the feelings feeling will move. <laughs> before I started uh, my administrative positions, so that was over a decade ago. I applied here and there and everywhere, and I was constantly, you know, being rejected. I was angry. I was bitching. I was li living at, at home with my parents back then. I was 18, 19, something like that. And one day my father headed up to here with me and said, listen, Junior, you're a nice kid and everything, but you're stupid. And even you wouldn't hire yourself. Just learn some new things, man. You can't rely only on college. What the? I'm like, yeah, he's right. I, I wouldn't hire myself. So he was right about that. So I had to take a few additional courses here and there to, to puff my, my biography a little bit. But yeah, be honest with yourself, because uh, I, I honestly, I wasn't honest with myself. And, you, you know, at some point, you had to be man enough to admit it. So I, I couldn't true. agree more with you. Definitely. Yeah, no, true. True. I think the, and, and it's good that you're doing this podcast, because there's a trend I'm noticing, and it's still emerging, where I'm seeing the rise of, and I'm using the, the term a workplace influencer. I'm seeing that rise, where people who, Yes, you've got a role, but beyond what you do, you are also connecting the dots beyond your organization, beyond your career, beyond your industry, providing, con train, providing content, your facilitated conversations like you're doing. And it makes a huge difference, not just in your ability to influence, but the way you develop yourself. Um, and, and you can already see this pattern happening. There, there are some companies that put out it, it seems it seems simple, but they'll put out a post on LinkedIn. It's a company, got a thousand staff, they put out a post, post on LinkedIn and somebody else, an individual who works in that same organization puts out something else and you get a lot of engagement from the individual because they've built out, they've built up their, their profile as a workplace influencer. Yep. There's a personality there. So the power dynamics is shifting. This is a change that's emerging. Um, so even if so you may say, okay, that's not for you, but the reality is that's what's happening today. That's how organizations need to evolve. That's how individuals need to evolve. So you can no longer say, okay, I've got this title, that's it. How are you becoming a workplace influencer? How are you connecting the dots be be beyond your nine to five to your the, the fact that you, you, you're in a, in a global village? How are you connecting those dots? So it's it's always looking at, so when I say, how did I get here? It's kind of about observing around you, what's changing, really, really asking the questions. And sometimes the answers you get to your point, you may not like them yep. because you get to one level, but yes, you've, but when there's another change, even though you've become comfortable and you've become really good at this, you need to be ready to change again and then take action again because you take a course, the course I took, five years ago it's less relevant today than it was five years ago i couldn't agree more and uh have you know i'm sure you've noticed that but the issues that we're facing and the problems that we have are kind of we're having them because we are at the level to face them we wouldn't be having them like five years ago or ten years ago we wouldn't even be thinking about those problems because they were far from us like like you know if the Lord is willing and the creek don't rise, we will face another issue in 10 years, an issue that we don't even know and think about today. But we're always facing problems that are just on our level. Otherwise, we wouldn't face them. And since it's on our level, that they're manageable. You just really have to be aware and to connect the dots, as you said. So definitely, 
right right up over there the third question is how did you knew that this was the way to go and the reason i'm asking is because you i'm certain you've noticed this as well people tend to go to colleges universities just for the stigma that you have to have a degree and i received a few feedbacks on linkedin and other social media like then you have a problem with colleges and no i don't I, I went to college i graduated so obviously i don't but i knew what i wanted to do so it wasn't really an issue for me but this stigma that you have to go over there and have a diploma to secure your future this is the dumbest thing i've heard all year and we actually had elections here so there were a lot of stupid around me so mm -hmm. uh it, this is why I'm asking. How did you knew that this was the way to go? Was this a gut feeling? Did you did you add a specific mentor who aimed you? Because as as I said in the beginning of the program, there was no way you could have handled this if you were an already naturally uh, people's person. And there's nothing wrong if if somebody is not people's person. People are different. Some people are way more more, more technically orientated. Others are more social. There are others that aren't social. It doesn't really, you know, it's not something that can be classified as good or bad. But in your specific case, that was exactly it. You're just a social person, whether it's a, a gift or something like that. I don't know. But how did you knew that you can use this and aim it? And how did you figure out how to position yourself, as you said, for the next five years so that you can shift into this uh, outsourcing ocean that we're all sailing in? Yeah, so it's, so it's a very good question, sir, and, so, and it's the challenge you want to answer. But I'll, yes, so I first of all touch on the the you know what you mentioned there. How do you are people being social or not? Because that's an actually interesting one for me personally. Given my background as a software developer, you know, software developers, the typical software developer is seen as not being social, not connected. Yeah, and there's there's, there's truth to that. There is no skill you cannot learn if you are ready to do the work. Even if you are, you know, a complete introvert, you can completely become a celebrity if you choose to do the work and get out of your comfort zone. There is no skill you cannot learn. You just need to ask yourself the critical questions and take the steps. Um, so that that's the first one. Then in terms of how did I know this was right? In retrospect, because that's the only way you can look at this is in retrospect. There is no, it's not, our lives are not linear parts. Our careers are not linear parts. They are completely non-linear. Things you know, we don't we don't know. The future is not is unknowable, but you can prepare for it and you can make the most of the opportunities that come. So I'm going to use a slightly. It'll be an interesting example, but just stay with me. There's this movie, Frozen Two. I haven't you watched. You, I, I, had, I have a niece. <laughs> that's fine. When, when Frozen Two came out, she was already a big girl, so we didn't watch. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so it, it, so. And in Frozen 2, there are two sisters. There's Elsa and Anna. And Anna is actually the hero of the show. And when she's on a quest looking for her sister, and there's something she keeps saying. She says all she can do, she doesn't know how to find her sister. Her sister has magical powers. She has nothing. All she can do is take the next best step. That's all she can do. And in reality, your careers, that's all you can do. Look around you, be honest and take the best next step. And that's and the way I'll look at it. Because if you really think about it, if you do the next best thing and the next best step, as you said, and if you fail, then you have zero reasons to be angry about it because you did your best. There's nothing more that, that could have been done. It, it didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't and happen. I, Fine. You, you, and you I think the, the irony is, is you can't even call it failure, right? If this is the context. You did the best next step and it didn't yep. work out. Okay, you've learned something. Yep. Now that you are here, do the next best step, right? W whatever it is. And it may not work out exactly as you planned, but you're somewhere else. Do the same thing again. So that's that's the way I've always looked at it. That Just do the next best step. The, the other principle, and this is more from a strategy and leadership perspective, is there's a, and I did this course years ago, where I learned about Muyimato Musashi. So Muyimato Musashi is a legendary, legendary Japanese swordsman. And he had a principle called the gazing principle. And something you can Google called the gazing principle. And the gazing principle means you have this, what you call like a dual focus. You have one eye laser focus on the present. What do I need to do right now? What do I need to do for the next two hours? What do I need to do 
in this instance. Well, at the same time, you need to be constantly switching contexts to a bigger focus. What is happening over the next 10 years? And you're always switching contexts. And the reason why he learned and practiced this was he was a he was a military man, he was a swordsman. In battle, it's no point winning a battle if it guarantees you will lose the war. Right. Yeah. So right. So in your careers, it's no point chasing the goal if it guarantees that you'll be unfulfilled for the rest of your life. You really need to have that dual focus. What do I need to do today? Be laser focused on the task for today, but also what's happening in my industry for the next 10 years? What does, like when I was a, a software engineer, I was asking myself the question, what does software engineering look like in 10 years from now? Where will the teams be structured? What will the leadership roles be like? Well, and this based is such on that a dynamic context, profession. It's next to impossible to predict what will happen. <laughs> Uh, I remember there was one time when I had to write a procedure because we moved, uh, you know, our jobs uh, will be shifted to India. So I had to write a procedure uh, and the manager in India called me and said, listen, I, I hate to ask you, but you really have to do it step by step, like everything that you're doing. <laughs> and I ended up with a 75 page procedure. And, and by the time I finished it, and, and I gave it to them and I showed them how it's done. And they changed the interface of the bank next next week. I, I had no idea that this would happen. So basically the position worked accurate a week ago. And this is in with us. We're, I'm, a, I'm in a financial department. I've, I've always been. So, mm. yeah. And I can only imagine how dynamic your your thing is. Because you're way up there in the yen yen. So... <laughs> It's, how do you even consider 10 years from now, especially in something so dynamic? Yeah, no, so I think, and, and that's where the dual focus comes in. When you when you laser focus on what's happening for the next years, there's a level of detail of what's happening this hour, what's happening tomorrow. There's a level of detail you have. But when you're thinking, zoom out, and you know, depending on the context, it might be different, but I tend to go for like a 10 year trend. So okay. Zoom out 10 years. You ignore the noise. You ignore the little details. Say, what is really going on? And then you begin to see patterns emerge. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain one pattern I've seen, and it's more it's big picture industry wide. Yeah, please do. Uh, the if you look at what's happening with the crypto space, right? Yeah. You can draw a parallel to what happened with the dot com bubble. You can see parallels where there's a lot of hype with an industry there's a lot a lot of hype with the technology and everybody gets into it and at some point you have a failure because people realize this is not going to make money for 80 90 percent of people in this space you're going to lose money and at that point the the noise the press the media goes down but the real bones the real winners the real successful people have figured out how to dominate that space and that's when they take off. And it was only after the dot-com bubble that the real tech giants began to emerge. So you can begin to see those patterns that, okay, with any new industry, even it's gonna happen with AI as well. When there's lots of hype, you can see that trend. Okay, this is, this is the phase. This is the season of lots of hype. This is the time where everybody's learning. Then you're gonna have this complete collapse. Yeah, it always happens. <laughs> yep. It will happen again. And then the people who've done the grunt work, no glamour and maybe the glamour will come later but at that point in time there's no glamour if you look at amazon that everybody's making noise about today when they first started there when they first started what it were was, they was doing? selling they, books it was like an online bookstore that's it they were selling books and they were selling the books cheaper than they actually bought them when they started yeah sorry so they would buy a book and sell it for less than they bought them lose money non-stop selling books just to build a platform that's now how they are... actually started sorry that's how that's... walmart actually started as far as i know so you uh, so you but but that's the trend they've they figured out the technology figured out the use case understood what was required to get it across but they were not part of the hype of the dot-com bubble so this is the trend so when you when you look at um trends you almost need to forget the noise 
and look at what is happening, what is the pattern. And it may not be Amazon. It may not be Amazon. They might have been two, three, you that player. But when you look at that high level, you, you forget the noise and you, you look at the resolution slightly different. And that's the way, that's the way I approach it. And we, with careers, what I see in the future, I think careers are going to be a lot more dynamic. I think this is probably why you've been, you know, you're motivated to have this kind of podcast. Because, yes, you might have trained as an accountant. You might have trained as an engineer. What is the, the, the requirements in the next 10 years might be very different. Even yep. the requirements of leadership will be different. The location. my of, father telling me yeah. when he was young, and my father is 70 years, I think, now. Uh, and, and he was told that if you learn how to fix a television, a, a, a TV, you always have a job. Now, consider this. Uh, this was like 54 years ago. I, I don't know about you. I personally have never fixed a phone or a TV. If it's broken, I'm throwing it out and I'm buying a new one. And, and this kind of happens every five, seven years, something like that. I have I don't even know if people fix TVs anymore. Maybe there are some if you have like special attachment, but I don't. So definitely. But I, I couldn't agree more with you. You definitely need to uh, to feel the trend. I, I couldn't agree more. Bob's, uh, if you have about an advice for because you know this channel is mostly is viewed by interns stuff like that folks that are just starting their career if you have some advice for them or for anyone else what will it be man so i'll, I'll say observe the changes around you and just take the next best step yep. based on what you see um don't overthink it do your analysis but don't overthink it don't think to the point whereby you can't act but do observe the changes don't get stuck in your, your head that this is how I want the world to be and therefore the world is not being fair. This is how the world is. Okay, based on the way the world is, what do I need to do? And then act in the world as you say it and observe and repeat again. That's what I'll, that's what I'll advise anyone is it, regardless be career in life, it's the way to go. I couldn't agree more. Huge, huge thank you for taking the time to be with us. I really appreciate it. Wish you all the best and we'll definitely be in touch. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts as well. Thank you. Right on. Goodbye. Guys, I hope this one was useful. Please follow the channel on YouTube, Rumble, Gap, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Ring the bell and all the good stuff. Have a nice week ahead and I'll see you next Sunday.